My name is um, Henry Silverman. I'm a professor of medicine at University of Maryland in, in, in the U.S. I have a strong interest in, in ethics, research ethics, uh, also medical ethics as well. And uh, I've been uh, in uh, um, training in Myanmar since 2015. I have a, a grant from the National Institutes of Health, and I've been dealing with uh, people mainly from University of Medicine One. Uh, we established a diploma program in research and research ethics, and I I really uh, value this opportunity to uh, collaborate and and interchange with other other people. Uh, with the NGOs, national and international NGOs, and, and know better what kind of research you are all doing uh, in your NGOs. And, and that really helps me out. And so if you're able to share any uh, research protocols uh, that you've done, and uh, a few of you have done that, and uh, that, that helps me understand better what kind of research you're doing and uh, that would um, uh, help, help me understand what kind of training uh, would be would be appropriate. Um, all right, so I um, I I uh, consider this as kind of like an introductory lecture or uh, presentation. I, I I don't like the word lecture. I like presentation because I. I want to encourage people to, if there's any questions you have about any of the materials I'm, I'm going over, please feel free to unmute yourself and, and uh, let me know, and I'm happy to explain. Having said that, I, um, I've tried to incorporate some kind of um, uh, interactivity uh, with this uh, presentation. Um, so having said that, so uh like to um right good um talk about why why do we have research ethics what what is the uh reason why we want to talk about research ethics so what we have to do when we do research is we have to balance two goals one we do research because we want to advanced science. Uh, however, research, when it involves human subjects, we also have to protect their welfare and, and their rights. The, the problem sometimes comes when we are very enthusiastic about our research and we let the advancement of science overwhelm our interest in the protection of the welfare and rights of in individuals. And it's not necessarily because we're bad researchers, uh, though there's been bad researchers in the past. The, the issue is that we, we don't know enough about research ethics in order to uh, balance the advancement of science with the protection of welfare and rights. Uh, so now the history of research ethics is such that that has, that has been the problem. Uh, there's been an imbalance with balancing these two goals, advancement of science and the protection of the welfare and rights of the subjects. Now, uh, before the 20th century, Research was small scale, involving just a few individuals. However, in the beginning of the 20th century, we started to do large uh, uh, type of clinical trials and started to collect system, uh, systematic data or data systematically. And it involved groups of individuals. And unfortunately, most of these individuals were vulnerable. We'll get back to that word uh, later on, what what do we mean by vulnerable? And what who were the vulnerable people who were targeted 
in the research. They uh, consist of mainly of prisoners, orphans, and the mentally ill. The problem was that there was no formal close of research ethics. Then we have the famous Nazi doctors during World War II performing experiments on, on uh, humans without their informed consent uh, and with the uh, prospect that knowingly that many of these subjects would die at the end of the experiment. And after World War II, they were put on trial for the murder of concentration camp inmates who were used as research subjects. And at the end of the trial, many of the Nazi doctors were found guilty and hung or given life sentences. Now, the Nuremberg judges developed the Nuremberg Code, but how they developed the code is very interesting. Uh, they, they asked the question, how, how could doctors be part of these experiments? Didn't they take the Hippocratic Oath and uh, do no harm? And the Nuremberg judges um, realized that the Hippocratic Oath, or whatever oath doctors take when they graduate, was, was not enough. Was not enough to prevent these uh, 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 tragedies. So what they did was they took the do no harm part of the of the Nuremberg uh, of the Hippocratic Oath and combined it with a concept of human rights, and that became the Nuremberg Code. And hence, the Nuremberg Code is considered a combination of human rights and welfare subjects. It consists of ten principles, um, and uh, the first and longest principle was that the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. The other, uh, Article 9, the other uh, human right in the Nuremberg Code is that subjects have the right to withdraw at any time without giving any reasons. Other principles in the Nuremberg Code uh, mention that every research has to have scientific value, a favorable risk-benefit ratio, and suffering by subjects should be avoided at all costs. Now, having said that, research does involve risks. However, our job is to identify those risks and minimize those risks as, as much as possible. And we'll talk about that in the weeks ahead, about balancing risk and benefits. However, even after the Nuremberg Code, uh, research abuses continued. Um, a famous article in 1966 by Henry Beecher, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, he cataloged 22 cases of research abuses occurring in the, in the U.S. Uh, one of these studies involved the withholding of antibiotics from patients with rheumatic fever. Uh, another one, a study involved purposefully infecting institutionalized children with hepatitis, injecting live cancer cells in nursing home patients, and, and, and other studies mentioned in this article. Essentially, the abuses and exploitation of humans in research continue despite having ethics codes. So another study uh, that had research abuses consisted of the Tuskegee syphilis study, 1932 to 1972. Uh, essentially, back in the early 1930s, um, syphilis was widespread among many communities, and they didn't have many good treatment. And um, the actually, the Public Health Service of the U.S. government wanted to wanted to study the natural course of syphilis in African Americans because they thought that syphilis had a different type of disease pattern in African Americans 
versus whites. Uh, now, the ethical issues in this study was that there was inadequate disclosure of information. And in fact, the subjects thought that the lumbar puncture was actually treatment. And then the major abuse was that when penicillin was discovered in the 1930s, early 1940s, they did not give the subjects in this study the penicillin because that would, that would ruin the study. So penicillin was withheld from these subjects. Finally, in 1972, uh, press reports caused the U.S. government to stop the study. So after hearing about all these abuses with the Tuskegee study and the studies mentioned by Henry Beecher, the U.S. passed the National Research Act in 1979. So actually, uh, the regulations became law. It had the force of law. And this uh, law required independent review of research by institutional review boards uh, or IRBs. And essentially, the thought was that the ethical review of research could not be done by investigators. They had a conflict of interest um, in trying to approve their own studies. And also, they published the Belmont Report. And uh, I'm trying to remember if I have that report on, on the website. I'll check and make sure that it is on the website. And it's, it's uh, the Belmont Report is probably shorter than some of the informed consent forms you have that you give to your patient. So uh, the next time you give an informed consent form to your patient or to the prospective research participant, while, while he or she is reading the informed consent form, you could be reading the Belmont report as well to make sure you're giving a valid informed consent. Um, so this Belmont report has served as an ethical framework for protecting human subjects for more than 30 years. So what are these um, principles of, of research ethics? So uh, the first one is, is, is thought to be autonomy. People have the right to express their uh, own autonomy, uh, essentially decide for themselves whether they should be in a research study. How, however, actually, uh, in the Belmont report, they don't talk about autonomy. They talk about respect for persons. And the reason why they do that is because uh, uh, one realizes that in order to do research that affects children, the mentally ill, even prisoners, uh, uh, we have to respect them as persons. And uh, if we can't get informed consent from the mentally ill or from children, we need to have other protection mechanisms, such as getting informed consent from, from their parents or some other legally authorized individual. Again, we'll, we'll talk more about vulnerable subjects and safeguards and to whom to get informed consent form. So actually, it's respect for persons that's the first principle of research ethics. Uh, the other principle is benefic beneficence. Uh, we need to try to do good, but actually, uh, so we want to maximize benefits and minimize potential harms to human subjects. But Actually, beneficence has two meanings. One, we want to have social value and enhance the health of society. And then, if possible, the 
the research participants. So not every research will necessarily have a potential for direct benefits for all the subjects. Because research is not designed to enhance the health of research subjects. If it does, that's fine. Uh, uh, but we, we need to, we can't mix up research with medical care. Research is not designed to give medical care. If it does, that's, that's okay, that's good. But the major beneficence is with society. Uh, and we want to make sure we enhance the social value of the communities where the research is being done. And we'll talk more about social value as well um, uh, later on today and, and in the upcoming weeks. And, and the CIOM guidelines actually enhance um, uh, um, put and, and enhance emphasis on social value. So again, the beneficence is really mainly for society. And then, and then the last uh, principle is justice. And at the reading, at the time of the writing of the Belmont report, it uh, justice was mainly concerned with do not exploit vulnerable persons, uh, do not target vulnerable persons if it's not necessary to include them in the research. Uh, but uh, since um, uh, the onset or the pursuit of international research, uh, justice has taken on an additional meaning, essentially making sure, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, that we don't exploit uh, subjects and we have to have uh, a fair sharing of the benefits. Think about this, a, a research project when we do informed consent with an individual, it's actually a transaction. We are transacting with the person and each party to the transaction has to get a fair share of the benefits. So let's say a drug company wants to test a drug, uh, the drug company will get its benefits, they deserve it, but then the subjects and the country has to get their fair share of their benefits as well. So we have these four principles. So the Belmont report was um, written for the US and other countries have adopted the principles of the Belmont report, but we also have international uh, research standards as well. We have the Helsinki Declaration. They first produced the document in 1964 and it had undergone uh, about 12 or 13 different revisions. The latest one in 2016, uh, think about this. We keep on revising the codes. Why, why do we keep on doing this? Uh, well, one, we keep on learning about how, how, how to do research in the right way. And uh, as, as uh, situation changes, like um, as drug companies uh, started to do research in other countries, other, other principles had to, um, had to be developed uh, to, uh, to meet the needs of new types of research. The Helsinki uh, Declaration applies the Nuremberg Code for research that involved patients who are receiving medical care. Now, remember, the Nuremberg Code said the informed consent is absolutely essential. That code was written for 
not for patients, but for individuals without illness. And after, uh, in the 1950s, when people started to do research on patients, uh, especially involving mentally ill and children, studying the illnesses that they had, they, they realized that informed consent could not be obtained from those individuals. So the Helsinki document um, was written um, to uh, involve patients who are receiving medical care. And if one could not get informed consent from the patients themselves, then uh, one, again, would need to contact their, their, um, uh, their legal guardian. Uh, they also mandated that research must be reviewed by an independent uh, review committee. They also talked about placebo trials. Uh, that's, a, that's a huge subject as well. And may, may, maybe we'll have time to get into that as well. And then there was the CIOMS um, guideline, the Council for International um, Medical Sciences. The first, the first one was um, uh, developed in 2002. Uh, and then I had, uh, uh, it was later revised in 2016. Uh, so even with these international codes, we still had problems with research in the international arena. Uh, in 2006, uh, Pfizer uh, performed a clinical trial in Nigeria. They uh, used an unimproved drug for the treatment of meningitis in, in children uh, when there was an epidemic. Uh, that is absolutely the wrong time to start testing an unapproved drug uh, against another drug, which uh, was thought to be inferior uh, to the drug they were testing. There was a controversial trial in Cameroon and other countries in Africa uh, testing an AIDS drug. And there was a lot of protest from the sex workers because they thought they were being exploited uh, with having this new AIDS drug tested on them. And then uh, essentially there was a large concern about the outsourcing of clinical trials in other countries. So as I said before, the CIOMS issued um, uh, their new document uh, in 2016. And uh, I, I have, uh, you should download that copy of the CIOMS document, and that is uh, indispensable reading. I, I really encourage everyone to read that document. Um, it, it has uh, a, lot of, a lot of good um, uh, explanation about uh, uh, co current concepts of, of what you're doing. Uh, now, the CIOMS, the 2016, I uh, just uh, mentioned a few of the um, items that was emphasized in the reading that you had. Uh, one, again, the social value of research. They really emphasize the social value of research. Essentially, the, um, the prospect of generating knowledge and the means necessary to protect and promote the health of the population in which the research is being conducted. Essentially, uh, when one does research on a certain population in the country, the research has to address a significant health need of that country because you're trying to improve the health of that, of that country. Um, uh, what, whatever that health need might be. Um, and uh, they also mentioned that there is an obligation to make available any interventions that's proven effective in the research as part of the broader obligation to care for the participants' health needs. And in fact, 
it, it also talks about an obligation to ensure or to um, manage the health needs of the participants even after the research is over. Um, and also, uh, if there's time, and, and I know there, there is interest, uh, we, we could also go over this concept of ancillary care benefits where, now I know I mentioned before the major uh, reason why we do research is not to provide medical care. However, let me walk back a little on those comments because there, there is, um, has been an emphasis on actually providing additional care to participants even, uh, and we're, we're talking about care that's not the primary uh, purpose of the research or we're not providing care for research injury. Essentially, there is this concept that uh, uh, research subjects or participants are, are actually uh, allowing us to invade their privacy. And some people think that, uh, and hence, we have an obligation to provide what I'm calling now ancillary benefits, uh, benefits that lies outside of the scope of the research. And again, depending on what kind of research that you're doing, that, that they may be relevant. Uh, well, actually, it is relevant uh, to what you're doing. So maybe we'll try and review that as well. Um, also, the uh, CEM talked about community engagement, uh, a very important uh, topic. Uh, essentially, we, we don't want to just do research on the community. We do, want to do research with the community. And in fact, the community could actually enhance, enhance our, our research efforts by helping us with informed consent, with even designing the study to, to make it more productive and also help with disseminating the results. Um, other, um, other parts of the new uh, CIOMS uh, uh, guidelines, uh, let's see now. Uh, oh, talked about researchers and ethics committees to evaluate the specific context-dependent characteristics that may place participants at increased risk of being harmed and hence vulnerable. So uh, what, the, what the heck does that mean? That, that means that we, we want to get away from label, labeling groups as being vulnerable. We want to look at the specific context of the research itself and where it's being done and, and then determine if certain persons are more vulnerable than others. So, uh, and as we'll talk about in a few weeks, vulnerability depends on certain characteristics of the person uh, themselves and also the context of the research. Uh, and for vulnerable persons, we need to have special protections for these individuals. So let me just say right now, and I'll keep on repeating this, uh, with vulnerable individuals, uh, to involve them in research, we have to have special justification as to why we are invol involving vulnerable subjects. And the main justification is that we are studying, we are researching or studying an issue that involves them. So, for example, if we're testing out a drug for hypertension, we don't necessarily need to involve vulnerable subjects. We don't need to go to the mental institutions and, and enroll people with mental illness. We could try out 
the study on less vulnerable patients. So again, we need special justifications to include vulnerable people. If, if we're studying a research issue that involves them, uh, let's say you're doing a certain uh, implementation research, um, and uh, well, I, obviously uh, we need to involve them. But if we're going to involve them, we need special protections. And we'll, we'll talk about that as well, but just to give a, a glimpse, special protections mean, mean having a legal guardian to help um, uh, protect their rights. It could be that in research that has no potential for direct benefit, we may want to make sure we limit the risk to, to this concept of minimal risk and other types of protection as, as well. Uh, and, and they talked about um, the CIOMS, about uh, uh, in the last 15 to 20 years, there's been an emphasis on doing studies on biological samples. And I think some of your studies also involves uh, the um, evaluation of, of, um, of biological samples. And there's uh, this whole concept of um, uh, 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 informed consent for future studies with these uh, biological samples. And I, um, I, I need to get a, a better feel, a, a better um, uh, appreciation of how much of your studies that you're doing involves the collection of biological samples for, for future unspecified research. And if I, if I get that, um, If I, if I get that understanding that you're doing a lot of that type of research, then we'll, we'll go over that uh, type of studies as well. Um, okay, so uh, now again, let me uh, just clean up the mess. Uh, all right, so we have these uh, research ethics principles autonomy or really respect for persons and beneficence and justice, okay? So how, how do we operationalize these principles when we're doing research? Do we keep on talking? I mean, how do we specify it? How do we make it more applicable to the research study? So this is what this is what I want you to do. Uh, I want to put you to work, okay? All right, so does everyone know how to annotate? Uh, use the annotate function on your, on, on the top there should be some, a toolbar and it says annotate. Uh, is that, are you finding that? You know, on your Zoom, yeah, you're, you can annotate. Uh, so, okay, good. Some people are shaking their head. Yes. Okay. So this is what I want you to do. I have, I have a bunch of um, concepts here, um, and these are good. All of them are good concepts, but I want you to. Um, I want you to use your annotate button and circle the concepts that you think are particularly important when one is doing a research study or one is reviewing a protocol to understand the ethics, the ethical requirements for review. Okay, somebody, okay, good, excellent, thank you. Confidentiality is one. Okay, why don't you just start circling? Thank you, Irene. Okay, good. Yeah, you're allowed to circle twice. If someone beat you to it, 
you could, uh, all right, I'll give you a few minutes. Okay, I guess you could, I guess you could use the heart button. That's okay. Uh, All right, let's see what we have here. All right, good, scientific validity. Uh, someone, someone missed something here. Okay, uh, all right. Okay, let's, uh, okay, that's, uh, that's good. All right, good. So, uh, that's, uh, excellent, good job. Uh, very good, so let's uh, take a look at this. Um, so, uh, for sure, uh, we have social value. In fact, that's the first thing to analyze, social value. If a study does not have social value, there's no point in even looking at the rest of the protocol, okay? There's no point in looking at informed consent. If it has minimal social value, there's no point in doing the research. One time when I was serving on a uh, IRB, we got this protocol from a tobacco company and they wanted to, to test out uh, uh, a cigarette that had less nicotine. And we said, this has no social value. So we rejected the protocol and we went home, okay? so. We didn't even look at the informed consent form, okay? Scientific validity, for sure. We uh, need to make sure that the research is scientifically va valid, that it addresses the objectives of the study, and that the methodology is such that, um, uh, that it will address the hypothesis in the objectives because it is unethical to involve human subjects in research in which the scientific validity is not there. It is unjustified to expose participants to the risk of research if we do not have a scientifically valid proposal. Okay, so the, uh, the, uh, uh, right. The, the other one is fairness in the selection of participants. Again, we should not target vulnerable subjects and we want to make sure that um, uh, there's uh, justification to bear the burdens of the research. So one, two, three. We need to have independent review of the um, protocol. Uh, we need to um, uh, minimize the risks, okay? Uh, and we have informed consent. Let me just say, if you go up to, I don't know, uh, someone involved in research and you ask them, what are the ethical requirements of research? The, the first thing they'll say is informed consent, okay? But which is a correct answer, but then they'll stop there. There are, you know, as we can see, a lot of other uh, ethical requirements. Uh, we got privacy and confidentiality. We'll talk more about that. Uh, we have uh, respect for enrolled participants. So what does that mean, respect for enrolled? Once we enroll them, we still have to respect them. Okay. And that involves that we have to monitor for their safety. We have to respect any requests for withdrawal uh, from, from the study. So we have to keep on respecting enrolled uh, participants. Uh, so um, social responsibility, uh, uh, I'm not... Um, 
uh, uh, three people circle that, uh, and uh, we, uh, if you're meaning about responsible conduct in research, that's that's uh, that's correct, uh, and maybe somebody could write in the chat box what else they were thinking about. But the um, the um, research ethics committee does does not evaluate responsible conduct and research. We could definitely talk more about that. Uh, that's more of an institutional thing. So, um, let's see, uh, I have this pop-up here. Uh, right, so what else? I think, um, I think those are the major ethical requirements for the review and conduct of, of research. Uh, respect for colleagues, for sure, you got to respect your colleagues, but the IRB doesn't really review that. Uh, honesty, sure, honesty, but the IRB doesn't really review whether you're an honest person or not. Hopefully you are, uh, but that's not necessary. We're talking about human research, so not really uh, a animal care. Uh, objectivity. Again, um, well, if if that's related to scientific validity, then uh, I I agree with that. So actually, um, okay, you're gonna have to help me out here. You guys are gonna have to clear your markings now, okay? All right, because you you messed up your slide. I think I might be able to do that. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. I guess. Yes, you know, part of this virtual teaching is understanding is understanding the technology here. Okay, very good. Those are the ethical requirements. So essentially, it's social value, scientific validity, uh, a, a balance of risk and benefits, and minimizing risk, uh, informed consent privacy, uh, and comp confidentiality, uh, and um, uh, respect for enrolled subjects, independent review, and also uh, community engagement. So now, uh, actually, I want to flesh out some of the more important comments with you, okay? So I'm going to, um, again, uh, put you to work because I'm getting a little tired of talking. So this is what I want you to, I want you to do. Um, let's see. I want you to write. So there's a website. Could you all go to menti.com? All right. Go to menti.com and put in this code. And then I want you to tell me. This is where you, I want you to tell me your issues. And you're gonna set the agenda for the next several weeks. So in the box, mention what are some of the difficulties with obtaining informed consent. This is anonymous, all right? So you could write down whatever you want, all right? What has been some of the difficulties you have had with obtaining informed consent? Accessing the, the website, cultural taboos. Well, okay, excellent. Right, uh, we, uh, we will talk about cultural aspects 
uh, obtaining informed consent. Oh, okay, scared of the term research. All right. Uh, education status of the participant. Oh, are there different, uh, in the Burmese language, are there different words you could use to, to um, mention research? Uh, well, well uh, think about that. Okay, language barrier, context, uh, perception. Okay, uh, language. Uh, all right, very good. Afraid of being participated on. Okay, education status. Limit, time limitations. Become confused. Oh, okay. Concerned about privacy. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, language. Okay. All right. This is this is this is good. We'll talk about this. All of this stuff when. We talk about informed consent, and in fact, I have a, a wonderful case study. Okay, excellent. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll take a look at that. Let me get back. So essentially, with the informed consent, uh, what are some of the difficulties? Uh, essentially, informed consent, um, one wants to enhance autonomy, uh, ensure that the individuals uh, decide for themselves to enroll in the research and that's consistent with their values and interests and goals and uh, and research uh, involving individuals who can't give consent requires surrogate consent uh, and then the issue is do western principles uh, apply across different cultures okay uh, you know belmont report Siams. One of the criticisms of Helsinki, Belmont, uh, and Siams is who who wrote them? It's mainly people from the West. They don't understand the Eastern culture, and and the um, uh, that informed consent is 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 more of a communal exercise, a uh, involving family, and not a a just the individual, and so we'll we'll talk about that aspect. Now, just uh, uh, really briefly, informed consent. Uh, the requirements of informed consent is to disclose the information to the participant and make sure that they have decision-making capacity, which means they have to understand the information, appreciate the information have the cognitive ability to weigh risk and benefits and come to a choice. Now, however, so we have disclosure of information, decision-making capacity, but it also needs to be voluntary, okay? In addition to being informed consent. So what I mean by um, voluntary, uh, so uh, a few days ago when I, I was preparing for this presentation. I was working late at night, okay? And uh, I, I went to my car, I finally decided to go home. I, it was dark. I, I went to my car in the parking lot and this guy came up to me and put a gun to my head and said, your money or your life, okay? And uh, so I think this guy uh, uh, went, to one of my previous lectures on informed consent because he gave me all the information I needed to know, okay, in order to make a decision. And I had decision-making capacity. I, I understood the information, your money or your life. I appreciated the situation I was in. And even though it was late at night, I still have the cognitive ability, okay? And I was able to make a choice. So what was that choice? Well, the mere fact I'm still here talking to you meant I, I, I gave him my money, right? Now, I don't usually carry a lot of money, okay? But I gave him my money, okay? Now, 
Did I make a voluntary choice? No. I I was it was perfect informed consent. I understood the information, blah blah blah. Okay, but it was not voluntary. So when we talk more about informed consent, we'll go over this um, issue about voluntariness of the informed consent process. Okay. So uh, now I want you to uh, have. Uh, how much more time should, uh, I mean, I don't have much more to do, but um, Han, uh, how much longer should I go on? 15 minutes, uh, uh, two more hours, uh, 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 you, another, another 15 minutes, what do you think? Yeah, I think that, yeah. Another okay, very good, minutes, fine. excellent, very good. Uh, so now I want you to go to, uh, let's see, right, uh, now I want you to go to menti.com, uh, I'll get rid of these writing. I wanted you to tell me what what do you think is exploitation? Think about that term. I want to know what you think. Okay, breach, unfair access of their participant benefits by their. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, okay. All right, abuse of autonomy. All right. Let me have a few more. Using power to achieve his or her benefit. Okay, that's uh, that's a good thought as well. Unf unfair advantages, unprotected rights, misuse. Okay, all right. Okay, let me. Maybe I'll have two more. Uh, misuse of consent, causing harm. Okay, all right. These are all all very good thoughts. Um, Misuse. Okay. All right. Very good. So let me. Uh, you you can keep on writing. Uh, I'm gonna look at this at the end of the show. Okay. Um, so what is exploitation? So, and we'll talk more about this. But exploitation is essentially uh, formally it means uh, it's a transaction in which one takes unfair advantage of the other person. So what does that mean, unfair uh, advantage? Uh, it's, it's a concern that's been um, uh, talked a lot in the literature when enrolling vulnerable populations in a low and middle income country. Um, as some of you have said, it's the use of someone else's for one owns benefits. Um, to exploit persons involves the harmful instrumental utilization of their capacities for one's own advantage. It's morally problematic, but in simple terms, it means unfair level of benefits of an individual exchange. So here we have this concept mutually ad advantageous exploitation. So what, what does that mean? So here you have a drug company, people in the developing country, and the drug company gets all these benefits. And the developing country just gets that. That's an unfair level of benefits in that transactions. Okay. Uh, now, uh, how to how to have fair benefits? Essentially, you want to make sure the country, the low and middle income countries, gets more benefits out of the deal. And we'll talk more about that in a future presentation. Um, so, I thought I uh, 
So essentially, CIRM says any intervention or product developed or knowledge generated has to be made reasonably available to the benefits of that population and community. And Helsinki says in advance of a clinical trial, sponsors, researchers, host country, and government should make provisions for post-trial access to that intervention. Um, essentially, um, the whole issue of international research could be summed up in, in this just one phrase. Um, who owes what to whom? Essentially, whom is usually going to be the research subjects, the community, the country, okay? Uh, what, uh, is, it, is it the drug? Or if it doesn't involve the drug, what kind of benefits? Uh, and we'll talk about capacity building benefits, building up the research infrastructure of the country, building up the health infrastructure of the country as well. There, there is this concept of health systems research, which is somewhat related to implementation research. And, and who, owe, who owes it? The sponsors? The researchers? The government? The international organizations? That, this is probably a very um, uh, controversial subject. Who owes what to whom? Okay, let's um, let's um, uh, do another. Since you're doing so well, uh, let's um, let me. Um, I want you to go back to menti.com. I I am very interested in how you define privacy. Okay, because I. I think that's a misunderstood term. Okay, so tell me what you think privacy is. And don't put down confidentiality. Okay? I want you to tell me uh, what, what is privacy. And let me, as you do that, let me clean up this board. Right to, right to personal information. Full safety of one's belonging. Feeling safe and getting respect. Not observed and disturbed by other people. Okay. This is a, a good thought there. I like that. I, I don't want to, privacy is a secret. Okay. Gaining no intrusion. Okay, access, yeah, okay. Respect for not sharing in public. Okay, psychologically safe. Okay, all right, privacy is a secret. Uh, not, not, own, own space, private space, okay. I like that, I like that. Uh, a few more thoughts? All right, okay, good. That's a, that's a, a great start. So, uh, so privacy is essentially refers, it's a right. It's a right of an individual to limit access by others to aspects of themselves that um, makes them who they are as individuals. Um, essentially, I, people have a right to have uh, essentially control over the extent, timing, and circumstances of sharing oneself, of who they are. People have a right to limit control of access to themselves, their data, their physical bodies, uh, their attitudes, okay? I have a right 
to present myself the way I want to present myself to the outside world. That helps me lead a life that I want to lead, okay? Without intrusion from other people, all right? Um, so it's a, it's a right, and the scope of privacy includes information, physical, bi bodily integrity, association privacy, have a right to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, decide which people are going to share in intimate uh, actions of myself, um, uh, control over personal identities, uh, decisional privacy. I have a decisional privacy. I, I have a right to make my decision uh, without uh, anybody trying to control what decision I'm going to make. And, and, and privacy, uh, again, is, is, is a right, and we'll talk more about that because I think a lot of the research that you guys are doing, uh, especially with social behavioral research, and we'll talk a lot about social behavioral research, about what uh, one of the major risks of social behavioral research is, is producing social harms uh, when privacy is violated. Now, when a research, when a participant agrees to be part of research, they are giving you permission to invade their privacy. And you have to respect that, okay? Um, and, uh, and we'll talk about, uh, I did a study recently asking investigators, uh, what are aspects of privacy in different, in different portions of a research study? Before the research is done, what are aspects of privacy that we have to respect? Uh, what aspects of privacy uh, occurs during the research study and after the research study? And, uh, and I, I want to make one last distinction uh, about confidentiality and privacy. Um, and essentially, people, people mix this up with privacy. Privacy is a right, and uh, we have control of our information, our bodies, our decisions, okay? Confidentiality is a process of protecting someone's privacy. We protect someone's privacy by limiting access to the information that people give us, okay? So uh, uh, when, when people, when research participants give us information, there's an expectation that this information will not be shared with others without permission. And if you intend to share it with other people, that has to be in the informed consent form. So confidentiality is an obligation. Uh, and the way I look at it is that confidentiality is a mean to serve privacy. It's a means to protect privacy. So everything about data, information, bodily integrity is all about privacy. Privacy is a right, obligation, I mean, confidentiality is an obligation. Okay, and let me skip this. Okay, one last thing before we leave, okay, since you guys are doing so good. I need to know, I need to know uh, how this will really help me out. I need to know, and we'll end with this, how do you define vulnerability? I want to know, how do you define vulnerability? In 200 words or less. Well, I'll make it 20 words or less. And while you're doing that, I'll, I'll clean up. Okay, we got one, weaker than average, okay? The weakest, fragile situation, okay. Okay, state of being exposed to being harmed. Uh, that's 
having more risk. Oh, okay, having more risk than others. Okay, that's I like that. We cannot protect ourselves. Okay, all right. Specific. Okay, cannot protect themselves. Okay, all right. Uh, any these these are okay. These these are these are good. Uh, uh, really good thoughts. Really good thoughts. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, let me just end. We'll have a whole you know section uh, a, a presentation about vulnerability, uh, but essentially vulnerable persons are those who are relatively or absolutely incapable of protecting their own interests, okay? Uh, and they may have, now, why is that? Why can't they protect their own interests? They may have insufficient power, intelligence, education, resources, strength, or other needed attributes in order to protect their own interests. And as I said before, if we involve vulnerable subjects with these insufficient attributes, we need special justification for inviting them, and, and we have to have special protect protections to uh, protect their rights. Uh, and uh, well, uh, well, yeah, that essentially they put themselves at greater risk of being used in inappropriate ways. And uh, the reasons for vulnerability in the context of research, there may be intrinsic and situational uh, factors that promote vulnerability. And what do I mean by that? Well, intrinsic means, uh, and many of you have said this, they may lack intrinsic decision-making capacity, either because, uh, and you all said wonderful things about informed consent, they may not understand it, they, uh, they have other intrinsic reasons why they uh, cannot understand the um, um, informed consent. And then situational stuff, we're talking about political, social, economic circumstances that make subjects vulnerable to exploitation or this other phrase, undue in inducement. Uh, so there are situational issues that uh, uh, could cause someone to be vulnerable. And let me end with this one last slide, okay? Okay, one last slide, all right? And let me just say, this is the, this is, um, someone from Africa who says, okay, in an environment where the majority can neither read nor write and is in wallowing in poverty and sickness, hunger and homelessness, and where the educated, the powerful, the rich, or the expat is a semi-god, how could you talk about informed consent? These are, you know, so there are multiple reasons why someone could be could be vulnerable, and we'll we'll weave out all these different aspects in a uh, um, a separate presentation about informed consent. So let me let me just end by repeating again. Uh, uh, well, one. Thanks for uh, staying up with me and not falling asleep. Uh, and, um, I'm glad I didn't fall asleep. Uh, and uh, let me just say that um, in the next few weeks, it has been really, really helpful for you to mention the type of research that you're doing. Uh, 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 you're doing very important, uh, a lot of social behavioral research, uh, uh, mixed methods research. And, and so we'll talk more about the issues in, in the type of research that you're doing. 
okay? Uh, I'm talking about social behavioral research, uh, aspects of privacy, exploitation, uh, vulnerability, all right? And uh, the, those are the major, uh, oh, informed consent uh, as well. And uh, so we'll talk about those issues in the next, I don't know, four, five, six weeks, as, as, as long as you could tolerate me, okay? We'll keep on going, okay? And if you have other ideas, please, please let me know. Uh, these sessions are for you. And again, if you if you are able to share some research uh, protocols, that's great. We'll uh, have also an exercise of reviewing a protocol as well. Now, now that you know the ethical requirements of research. Okay. All right. So, any any remaining thoughts? Uh, this has been wonderful. I I really do feel like I'm I'm teaching face to face. Thanks for showing your video, okay? And thanks for uh, smiling, okay? That makes me, yeah, yeah, that makes me uh, less vulnerable, okay? All right, okay. Oh, all right, okay. All right, all right, guys. Have a have a good evening, and uh, we'll talk more on the discussion forum. I I really value. Okay, guys, have a good sleep, and I'm, I'm going to go and start my day. All right. Okay. All right, guys. All right. Take care. All right. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yes. Let me hear the voices. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Okay. Bye. Have a good day. All right, thank you. Have a good night. Have a good weekend. Um, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, dude. Thank you for organizing. Yeah. Very helpful. Very yeah. helpful. Yeah, 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 yes. Yeah. I will. Uh, have a nice day. Okay, Rosa. you too, Han. Okay, take care. Yeah, see you. See you. Okay, bye bye.